Hi, thank you. So my job today is to talk to you a little bit about qualitative research and how we're going to be using that here in the CAT project. So to a higher degree uh, than any other place in the United States, the Corn Belt is this aggregate result of thousands upon thousands of individual private decisions, guided mostly by short-term and to a lesser degree long-term agronomic and financial um, goals and objectives. And as this project moves forward, as this CAP project moves forward and we're examining ways that to, to help farmers enhance their ability to produce increased amounts of food fiber and fuel sustainably in, in environmentally friendly ways and in, in light of some pretty significant emerging environmental challenges, it's really going to be critical to examine this system from the perspectives of those who are sort of the drivers of the system, and that's farmers. And so, you know, to that end, this CAP project has a fairly significant socioeconomic thrust. And as part of that, there's two major data collection activities that we're, that we're doing, and one of which Jay Arbuckle is going to be talking about in detail tomorrow, and that was some uh, Corn Belt-wide farmer surveys. And so I'm going to sort of touch on this in passing, but we're going to have a significant amount of data that we're going to be treating quantitatively, data about farmer positions on climate and weather-related risk and stakeholder roles and the current use and then the behavioral intentions towards certain kinds of practices. So to complement and to add value to this quantitative data, we're also going to be doing some qualitative research. And to that end, we're going to be doing some in-depth farmer interviews starting. We've done some preliminary stuff, but we're really going to be starting this in earnest this fall. And part of that is to really gain sort of a depth of understanding about the why and the how and the when that farmers decide to adopt or not climate adaptive or even mitigation oriented kinds of practices. Um, but it's also to help us engage sort of the extension educators as well as the farmers a little bit more directly in the research process. So, you know, very briefly, we've got educators, ed extension educators in nine different states who are going to be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with farmers. So we're, they're going to be doing between 20 and 24 farmers in each state. And associated with that is going to be sort of a farm level assessment as well as a very simple adaptive management plan that's going to serve as the basis for some of, some of our interview questions. And I'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. So a little bit about qualitative research. Well, it's exploratory as well as applied. And qualitative research is used when we need to help define a problem or, or develop a particular approach to a problem. It's also used to help sort of figure out the components of a system, to calibrate a system for systems analyses. And it's also very useful to test assumptions, particularly the assumptions that are part of quantitative models. And then we also use it very simply just to go deeper into issues of interest and explore the key nuances related to a particular problem. And the common methods that we use, most of you are probably familiar with these on some level. You know, it's focus groups, it's in-depth interviews, it's media and text mining. Um, and in some cases, you can even do ethnographic sort of things where you, you're sort of immersing yourself into the sort of a participatory perspective. So very simply, this is kind of what our simple process is, is that we've got these extension educators in these nine different states, and it's their job to get farmers. And so far, we've got 88 farmers on board to do these interviews, and we're going to be working to get that, to get that 200 level. Um, and we meet up, they meet up with the farmers at their convenience. And then this first, it's sort of in two phases. This first phase, uh, they're gathering enterprise data for two different fields, one field that is a pretty good performing field and another field that they're sort of challenged by, right? And so they're getting some enterprise level data associated with those. And with that information, we're going to be doing some very simple management planning regarding some relevant practices. So looking at cover crops or extended rotations or conservation practices, perhaps, and maybe even in some cases looking at drainage management for these systems. And then that information that we're going to be using some pre-existing tools that we might calibrate for this purpose. From there, we're going to sort of use that as a platform to begin this conversation about practices as well as, as, well as some other issues. Um, and we're going to be doing some what are, what's called sort of semi-structured interviews. And it's semi-structured in the sense that all the farmers are being asked the same questions, but each interview sort of takes on a life of its own in that, that the probing and the follow-up questions are contingent upon where the, the farmer wants the conversation to go. And so um, that's sort of the process that we're going to be using. 
And there's really three sections of interview questions that we're going to try to try to get out of these interviews. And one is, you know, we're going to build on that sort of that farm plan, that financial assessment, questions regarding different kinds of adaptive management practices, sort of the why and why not kind of a kind of a context. But we're also going to be um, asking questions designed to gain a deeper understanding of some of the trends that we're getting in the survey data that Jay's going to talk about tomorrow. And then the survey wasn't able to capture a lot of information. For example, we don't know what farmers think about certain things in light of this year's drought. We also don't know what they think about in terms of some emerging policy issues and so on. So we're going to use this as an opportunity to get at some information that, that we didn't otherwise get at. So, you know, thinking about practices, it, it basically it's, it's in the context of, you know, the why and why not. So I would imagine that when we have these conversations with farmers, just to use cover crops as an example, the conversation is going to be about these kinds of things, and we're going to be able to see if there's state-by-state -state nuances in terms of the knowledge levels that farmers have or their access to knowledgeable people, what are their perceived benefits or incentives, financial or otherwise. You know, what about some of the management issues, the spring planting dates, harvest windows, what if it's a wet spring, you know? And then in relation to that, how does that sort of impact different insurance policies that they have or other kinds of policies that may create constraints for how they manage these systems? And then certainly, what about the cost of the practices, the direct, the indirect, the transaction-oriented costs, and even opportunity costs will come into the conversation. You know, and so at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we're going to have 200 two-plus-hour narratives, dialogues with these farmers, which is actually a tremendous amount of data. And I, our graduate student, Gabrielle, sort of shivering a little bit, thinking about dealing with this amount of information. But there is, there, we've got tools that help us organize this kind of information. So, for example, we use a, a program called Invivo in my lab. Um, and it's, a, it's just a software program that helps us analyze text-based or unstructured data. And it's really useful to classify and to sort, to arrange information into different kinds of themes. We can examine relationships. We can look at patterns. We even can link it to biophysical data if we wish. And we will have some biophysical data, so we're going to explore opportunities to do that as well. And basically, we can do conceptual and different kinds of systems modeling using these kinds of tools. Um, there are more manual ways of doing this. This is an example of a former graduate student of mine who who commandeered about 10 different whiteboards and did this sort of thing to it. And, and it's, it was very effective for her. So, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to deal with this kind of data. But there is sort of a process associated with how you analyze these kinds of things. It, it, this data is very cumbersome, and so there is sort of a, a, a process here. And basically, you know, we're going to digitally record these conversations. We're going to transcribe them. We're going to enter them into a program like in vivo. And then basically, it's going to read the narratives. And we're going to start looking for categories or themes in what farmers are saying with regard to individual topics. And so you think about this sort of as an algorithm, you know, can all the responses be assigned to a theme? Well, yes, okay, great, it goes into a category or a theme. If not, then there's some further data refinery, refining and you sort of look at things a little bit more carefully. Once you start getting these themes that emerge, you get sort of a cross-category analysis. You can, you can concentrate on relationships. Again, you can look at patterns between themes. You can start looking at if there's patterns between farmers in different states, the types of farms that they operate, and, and so on. And then again, from there, a picture of what it is that we're trying to understand starts to emerge. And, and, and it applies to systems analysis. It applies to some theory development, sort of from an inductive perspective, and so on. So qualitative data, while it is cumbersome and it is, is challenging to deal with, there are is very sort of succinct and, and, and distinct ways that we deal with it. Um, it's not haphazard at all. And so, you know, again, to sort of think about how we're going to link what the quantitative research is doing with the qualitative and how we add value to it is this is just sort of an example. So um, the kind of data that Jay's going to be talking about tomorrow, it's really going to give us the power to, to do some statistical work and to generalize. So we're going to have survey data that gets at farmer interests in cover crops. And so the probability of using cover crops is hypothetically at this stage, associated with if the, is the farm diversified, is the farmer knowledgeable about the system, you know, if some farm characteristics come into play. And then issues like this, quantifiable economic benefits. Well, what does that mean? Quantitatively, we'll have a, a model that shows these sort of things, but when you get into the details of some of these, it's really quite interesting. So 
from a hypothetical farmer interview, we're probably going to get information like this. Thinking about economics, well, figuring out the cost of carbon crops might seem easy, but using them might add little unexpected costs here and there because of timing or because of weather. We're going to have conversations about, well, the benefits, well, they're hard to quantify. If you're benefiting the soil, it's a long-term investment. When does it pay off? How do you measure these sorts of things? And then really critically, the farmers bring to the table experiences of their own or their neighbors. So the guy across the way uses cover crops in last spring, this is 2011, it was so wet it messed up his insurance deadline. So how much does hassle and stress cost? These are the nuances that drive decisions that really kind of guide behavior. So it's critical that we understand these kinds of things. And I think Eileen's talking about cover crops next. She knows about this stuff because it's this sort of information that gets policy changed. In fact, it's this information that allowed the USDA Ag, um, uh, what is it, the disaster service or the, the risk agency changed their policy on insurance dates. So again, this kind of information is really critical to as we move forward. And, and that's it, I'm out of time. Mm -hmm.